actually let you install Debian in that machine, or you're just running it off of like a live CD or USB? I'm still running out of a, a external hard drive. Yeah, it's just a one terabyte external hard drive, and works pretty well. Sorry? Yeah, I kind of informed the lab people that you know this is kind of going to be the way it is. You know, people will bring in their live CD. You know, they don't need to have as many installed computers in the lab. Um, but I guess it, it, it takes time for that sort of stuff to sink in. Yeah, it, I found out uh, if one professor or two Mm -hmm. They'll look into doing it. It's the one, apparently one of the other professor wants all the boxes switched over, at least some of them, to Windows mm -hmm. 8. I think I've asked them once already, you know, to have some computers, like maybe one row, a few, that is open. The main concern is, you know, if you plug into their uh, wired network, they're concerned about the you know, security, you know, issues. Not log in. What about using a VM? They have those installed on all of them in there. But that's not as much fun as moving Well, they, they can lock down you know, a part of a segment of the network, you know, like a crash and burn. You know, they can certainly lock it down, but it's more kind of more work to get it configured. Well, Walter is kind of, you know, open to that idea. Yeah. yeah. He's going to close me if one professor requests it, then they can look into doing it. Well, I guess I'll just have to go in and let them know. Yes, that would <laughs> be nice. All right. Well, it is time to get started. Um, I was just kind of fiddling because I got a new distribution. There's a new one being baked as we speak right now, and I'm going to upload it you know, soon. So anyway... Um, do you guys have any problem with your homework assignment? You know, are there any questions about you know the quote unquote perfect start? No. Yep. Um, I created the app and on my phone, the image does not show up and the sound does not work. Hmm. But like it looks fine on the screen. Uh huh. Okay, somebody got it working. Yeah. <laughs> I heard a cat. <laughs> All right. So that's, you know, I think this is the one, you know, where you can just kind of get used to the environment, you know, get used to App Inventor. Um, so what do you guys think of uh, App Inventor? It's okay, you know, it's, yeah, it's kind of limiting in terms of what you can do with it, you know, so, you know, as you guys get more experienced and want to build more complicated apps, you know, it does give you a limitation like, oh, okay, I can only go this far with App Inventor 2. But the advantage, I've talked about this already, of App Inventor is it is the entry level or the entry, um, how do you call that, uh, barrier is really low. I mean, you just need to drag and drop, and you can kind of learn your way through it, you know, as you go. You don't, you don't need to refer to, like, you know, 20 different documents just to find out how to make it work which is the case in CISP 363. Okay, in CISP 363, especially if for people who do not have any programming experience with Java, then they'll be struggling with Java, you know, the language feature of Java, the concepts of writing you know, mobile applications, and the entire Android you know, library at the same time. So it would not be atypical to have 20 tabs open on your browser just to get through a you know twenty line program. Just documentation. Yeah, just because there's a yeah exactly there's just such a massive amount of documentation, and it's not just Android because you also have to understand Java. You also have to understand you know the basic development method of mobile applications. So App Inventor Two kind of simplifies everything, so you don't have to choose from many like twenty gazillion choices of how to do something. It gives you like one way of doing. It. Yeah, I think they people have been asking for that. Um, there is an intermediate representation of you know the Android application in text, 
So you can do certain things about it, but they don't really open it up. It's not well documented. You can kind of go through that and kind of have an impression of you know how things are represented. All right. So I just want to kind of make sure that you know everyone you know can get to perfect start without you know, any problems, and uh, you know, at least get your um, application running inside the emulator. When I grade it, it's going to be inside the emulator. So if you cannot get it working on an actual device, it will still be okay as far as grading is concerned. But it will be nice to have it working on an actual device as well. Right. So the project proposal will be, you know, ungraded out, you know, you know, after uh, perfect start is due. Um, and perfect start, I think, is due on Wednesday, right? Because last Monday was a holiday, and I always give you guys a week to work on your homework assignment. So it is due on Wednesday. So make sure you get started with that one as quickly as you can if you have not done it already. Uh, I expanded just one section more in terms of uh, objectives and values, and it has to do with gaming. Okay, you know, when you are writing an application that is a game, what are the use cases of a game? Why would anyone download your application? Because it's fun. <laughs> because it's fun. That's the value. Okay, but what are the use cases of a game? Sorry. But that's not a use case. You don't. You don't. You're. You. You just want to play. I mean, play is a use case. Yeah. Now you can kind of specialize play, like you know, single user mode versus multi user mode, network mode. And there are those are two use cases, okay. Um, what about saving a game? Is that a use case? Would you buy, would you download an app just to save and save the game? No, it's a feature, right? It is a feature to make your game um, more useful, you know, so that to more people, it, it, it's easier to save a game, and um, you don't have to start from scratch. Okay, when I played, you know, StarCraft, you know, I saved like, you know, I, the path name of my game save, you know, reflects, you know, where I am, you know, just so that I can back up one step. Okay, this didn't work. I have to back up to the previous step and then start over again. Okay, so saving a game is a feature, but it is not a use case. Okay, it is a part of playing a game, but by itself, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is basically just, you know, something that I wrote you know, about games. The problem with games, as far as use case diagrams are concerned, has to do with games are very experiential instead of functional. In other words, you know, a lot of stuff that you do in a game cannot be captured by a use case diagram, which doesn't mean that it cannot be captured. It's just that the use case diagram is not the right one to use for that purpose. So if you keep reading here, um, Use case diagrams are not really useful for that purpose, but in a UML, in a unified modeling language, they have such a thing called a state diagram, and those are very useful for games or anything that is interactive. State diagrams are really useful for that purpose. We're not going to get into state diagrams, but I just don't want to make this point um, in case someone is trying to write a game, you know, for this class, and they go like, "Well, you know, what what do I write down for my use cases?" That's not really a whole lot you can write for you know, games in, unfortunately, for use case diagrams. So that's um, what this slide is about. And then we'll kind of move on and talk about um, application design. You know, we can capture um, a mock sequence. Now this is kind of interesting because it is not going to, this is not a use case, okay? When you capture a mock sequence, it is called, um, there's a specific name for that. It's called a sequence diagram in the UML, in the Unified Modeling Language. Um, the purpose of that is kind of like a videotape. In other words, you are just kind of imagining, okay, what if a user is interacting with this information system, with this application? Um, what is one particular scenario of interacting with this system? And then you document that, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, this part here. We already talked about uh, basic user interface. We talked about static screen design last time. We talked about the three layouts. One is called horizontal, one is vertical, and the other one is a table or a grid type of layout. Um, so are there any questions about all of these things? 
Thank you. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Go ahead. Get started. All right. Um, so I will go back to that one, but I do want to give you guys more kind of programming concept first, you know, because I think you know some of you are really, really you know eager to get into programming. So what we'll do is we'll start with event handling today. And event handling is nothing that is specific to Android programming. Event handling is common to anything that is user action driven. Okay, so if you think about you know uh, a web browser, okay, like what I'm doing right now, it is event driven. In other words, unless I do something with with my mouse pointer with a keyboard, the application itself is just twiddling its thumbs. I mean, it's just you know sitting there doing absolutely nothing. Okay, I don't have any type of of uh, animated GIFs here, so there's nothing to, for the browser to do, you know, really, at all. Okay, it is until I move my mouse pointer, until I right click, then you know the application reacts to the event of a right click, and it says, oh, okay, you know, since the end user is you know, right clicking, I should you know, pop up a pop up menu to give the op to give uh, the end user options of what he can what he or she can do at this point of the screen. Am I making any sense? So this is called event driven programming, which is basically saying your program is not actively doing something, it is just listening to events. If there's nothing happening, it doesn't do a single thing. Okay, which is a very common model of uh, developing programs that has any type of user interface. As opposed to you know the good old days when we had DAWs. Does anyone still remember DAWs? Okay. Now back in the DAWs days, it is not event driven. Okay. Um, especially the original DAWs, you know, keeps pulling the keyboard. In other words, the operating system is constantly asking the keyboard, "Do you have something for me? Do you have something for me? Do you have something for me?" And that's why you know it's it's it wastes a lot of processing cycles. But with a good old you know x86 you know, processor, it doesn't really matter. There's no power saving mode to begin with, so there's no way to save power just by you know telling the processor and saying, well you know don't wake me up until there is something for me to do. But these days you know with the Intel processors and also with the Android um, devices, you know the processor can go into a very deep sleep state in order to save power when we use an event driven type of programming model. So we'll go ahead and talk about what is an event, but instead of doing that, um, this is something that you can read by yourself. You know, this is already written. So what I'll do instead is I'll use a demonstration. In other words, I'll switch to AI2 and then give you a demonstration of um, actual event-driven programming. All right, so I'll go back to my projects. I'm gonna get rid of these two. Uh, test projects. So to delete a project, you select the projects in this view. So you have to go to projects, go to my projects, and then you can select whatever projects you want to delete. You can select multiple projects and delete all of them at the same time, which is kind of convenient. So if you click delete project, it will ask you one last time, do you want to remove these two projects in this case? So I'm about to remove test two and test. So I click OK, and both of these projects will go away. Now since I'm using a Linux environment, I also have to start up um, AI Starter manually, and I believe it is the same thing with Windows. So I have to run AI Starter, which is pre-installed into this particular version of my live CD. And you don't have any projects. OK, fine. That's exactly what I want. So I start a new project and give it a name. So what I'll do is I'll just call this event handling. And once I create a project, it automatically switches to the new project, um, which is kind of handy, you know, but sometimes you know, I wish it doesn't do that. All right, so now we have a screen here, and it has nothing in it, okay? In other words, if you look at this center part here, it has nothing in it. But you know what? This is an app already, so I should act, I can actually test this quote unquote app as we as it is right here. So I go to connect, and since this is in the class setting, um, you know, using an emulator makes more sense because otherwise, you know, I can run it on my phone, but.
but you guys cannot see what is being run on my phone because it's too far away from you guys. So it makes sense to use an emulator because it just projects it on the screen and it's just easier that way. And I can always go back to the prompt here to make sure that it is interacting correctly. And it looks like it's starting up just fine. The, um, the Linux version of the AI setup program is also you know, kind of by modern version. You know, they had it up to version 2.1, but not 2.2. So I had to do something to make it work with uh, 2.2. And I think I have a pretty good idea of why it didn't work last time. Um, it probably had to do with I had the virtual machine file already created and it's conflicting with the update. So I'm just gonna hoping that it will work today without, any, without a hitch. should update it right there. Okay, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, if it is the first time you run um, the AI companion software, it will prompt you for an update. And you should, you should just let it update. So click OK, and it should do the update all by itself. So if I switch back to my emulator, Get the update. And while it is doing this, let me move on and talk about uh, event handling. Okay, so here's a screen. Do you think the screen is interactive? That's the question. Is there anything you can do with the screen all by itself? If there's no button, there are no uh, text boxes, there are no drop down boxes whatsoever, just the screen. Now, if this is in CISP 363, you will have to look up the Android documents, okay? And because they make use of, of object oriented programming, wait, they use inheritance to hide all the details that does not need to be respecified. To find out you know, whether the screen is interactive or not, you have to track down quite a few things, okay? But in this case, it's easy. The way you do, the way you find out what you can do with the screen is like this. Instead of using the design, the designer view, you switch to blocks view. In other words, you're going to look into the code or what can be written as code at this point. So you switch to blocks like this, and then you go to the component called screen one, okay, which is you know a particular screen, which is the initial screen, and it shows you what you can do with a screen. Now you can see all of these blocks here. Let me just use a mouse pointer to highlight what I mean by that. Now when you look at these uh, blocks here, these are all of the valid choices at this point. In other words, you can drag and drop any one of these blocks into the main part of this uh, window as a part of your program. In App Inventor 2, the when block, when you see a block that starts with when blah 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 do something, it is an event handler. It is what we, what we call an event an event handler. Um, so in this case, there are quite a few event events that can happen to just the screen all by itself. Um, the first one is hap it happens when the back button is pressed on a on the screen. Okay, so with some with most devices, there's a hardware back button. The newer devices, you know, are starting not to have a hardware back button but it is still a soft button for most applications. So when that button is pressed, this event happens, and then you can specify in the do part here of what you want it to do, okay? Um, when, screen, when screen one error occurred, same thing. You know, if something happens it's, that's erroneous, this will catch it. Uh, when screen one dot initialize, that means you know, when screen one is being initialized, um, the following will happen. Now this is useful because you know, when screen one is initializing, it means you know this is the first time you have control over this particular screen. So if you want to load anything from uh, deep from a database uh, to initialize the rest of the application, this is a good time to do it. Um, the other ones, some of these are kind of obvious, and some of these are not. 
all the screen closed, I'm gonna talk about it until we talk about how to switch between screens, okay? Because there's a mechanism for switching between screens and coming back to this screen from another screen. So we are not gonna talk about it until, at that, until that time. But this one is obvious, when screen one dot screen orientation changed. So when you rotate the mobile device, you go from the uh, portrait mode to landscape mode, this will get triggered. So as it is triggered, you can specify what kind of code you want to run when that event happens, okay? But when you look at all these events, for the most part, the event is not under the control of the application itself, okay? The application can choose what to do, how to react to an event, but the event is called asynchronous to the application, which basically means it is not something that the application has control over. Are we still doing okay so far with these concepts? Okay, all right. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, let's give it a try, okay? We'll, we'll actually give it a try you know, with the back press little event here. And here we'll go ahead and replace the application. And they only, you only have to do it once, okay? Um, the virtual machine is actually persistent. So if you use uh, a particular computer for your homework assignment, it actually keeps track of all of this stuff that is already installed and updated. So you don't have to go through this step every, every single time. So in this case, I have to uh, click done because I have to reboot the uh, virtual machine. So to reboot the virtual machine, I can, you know, this button never works for vir emulators. I don't know why. It's supposed to shut down the machine, but it only shuts down up to a certain point and then it stops. So for the virtual machine, it's actually okay to close it like this. And then we'll go back to here and reconnect to the, to the emulator. Reset connection and then go back and start up the emulator again. So this will take a while. We'll focus on you know, writing the program at this point. All right. So let's go, let's go ahead and start writing our program. So I'm gonna say when screen one back pressed, okay? So as soon as you drag the block out of you know, the previous window, it slides away and then it becomes a part of the program, okay? Which is a whole lot easier than writing, writing programs in Java because when you write programs in Java, you have to know exactly where to insert your, your own code um, and it's just, well, just believe me, okay? It is a bit more complicated than you're know, doing this. Okay, now I have just one single screen. What can I possibly do to reflect that, oh, the back key is just pressed? I don't have a single element on the screen either, okay? I don't have a button, I don't have any text label, I don't have any text boxes or anything like that. So what, how can I possibly make this program quote unquote interactive just when the back button is clicked? We can change the color, exactly. So what else can we do with a screen? Let's take a look. Click the click screen one, and you can find out what this object can do. Okay, this is a part of object-oriented programming. If you click on it, it shows you what it can do. Now this time we have to get past the when blocks because we are not reacting to an event anymore. We're specifying what to do when the event is um, when the event happens. So you can see all of these things. So, uh, there are two types of blocks here. This block here has a little notch on the left hand side, which means it can only be, it can only match the notch, you know, okay, let me just point it out on the screen here. See this notch over here? It has to match this notch over here. So this is how, this is quote unquote the syntax of App Inventor programming. Okay, there's no actual syntax that you have to learn, you just have to match the shape of these blocks and make sure they snap together. Um, what if you try to snap something that's, that is not of the right shape? It jumps out, it, jumps out, it, just, it just does not connect, okay? And that's your syntax, okay? All right, so what we can do is to pick something that's simple and obvious. Let's, let's pick uh, setting the background color of the entire screen. So now we can drag this one over. Now you can see how this little notch here, this little tab here, matches this little notch over here. That means these two should snap together. If you had your speaker on, it would actually give you a snapping sound, you know, as an audible confirmation and say, yes, these two blocks, you know, do connect, okay? 
so which is kind of nice you know because you know Java doesn't give you any type of audible feedback unless you do another extension in Eclipse <laughs> okay but this is kind of nice okay so now we can set the background to something um, so when you set the background color to something you're setting a, a different color so with the built-in blocks you can go to colors here and they have some colors that are predefined okay so these are all the kind of more or less primary colors that are predefined but in case you want to mix your own color you can also use make color as a block and then you can specify the RGB values of your own color which is kind of nice I mean, it gives you a lot of flexibility um, when we get to variables and actual programmatic thing you can also substitute 255.00 which are constant numbers into variables so now you can have your program to control the color of whatever color you want to set the background you know bitmap or whatever okay so we'll go ahead and just pick them something you know simple let's say we pick uh, uh, let's say we pick the, the kind of orange color here okay because the original screen is um, white in terms of background and now we make it a slightly different color okay now it is also important to note that back press originally had a default action already okay if you do not specify how to handle the back pressed event it it is automatically handled to close that particular screen okay now that I specify oh you know what I want to set the background color to kind of like a mango color here it does not close the screen anymore so if you still want to close the screen you will have to specify oh on top of this I also want to close the screen or I want to ask the user a confirmation and then close the screen because otherwise it does not close the screen anymore right okay so now that we have this app already written which only makes use of the main screen itself there are no other buttons or whatever you know user element in it let's go ahead and go switch back to the emulator and make sure we connect to it this is all running on the browser yep cool. yeah it's all running from the browser Should have made made a connection to the to the uh, emulator already. So we'll we'll just double check and see what's going to happen next. You might have started the Where? second emulator. Oh. No, no, it's good. It's making a connection, and it should be running the updated version, which is version two point two, which is good. So it's it's all you know, being done correctly, and here's my um, application running inside the emulator. Okay. So to test, quote unquote, to test the program, I'm just going to press the back button. And on the emulator, you know, it has a dedicated back button here. I press it, and it changes the background color to mango. Yep. Now what if you want to go back to the original color? Then you need to have a little bit more steps, because you need something else. You know, because we haven't talked about variables or conditional statements or anything like that. So I can't really you know, detect that, you know, oh, it's a mango color. Now let's switch back to a, you know, the original default color. All right. So we have just made, we have just written our first program that has user interaction using event handling. Okay. So remember, what is the event in this particular application in this example? When the back button is pressed, and a, and the response to that is to set the background color to a mango color which is very atypical of how you want to deal with the back button, but as a demonstration, you know, it does get the job done. Okay, so are there any questions about, you know, this stuff here? No? What about the other stuff? What about, if you go back to the designer view, you can see that, oh, but we can have buttons, check boxes, uh, labels, list pickers, and so on and so forth. What about, you know, those things, I mean, what can, what kind of events can be can be created with all of those other things? Well, one way that you can do is just to drag it into the main window, switch to the blocks view, and find out for yourself. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration here. Let's pick a text a text box, okay, which allows you to enter text. You know, just regular text here. Uh, the property box gives you you know control over the static stuff, uh, at least initial. Okay. In other words, you can look at the property box 
as how the um, text box is initialized. But most of the properties can be changed when your program is running. Okay, so I'll go through this, you know, just kind of quickly. The default color or background color of the text box is, you know, it's just taking the default right now. You can change it, you know, at this point to let's say cyan. Okay, or you can change it back to the default, which is none. Um, but your program has control over that as well. In other words, when we get to actual <laughs> coding, you can make it so that the text box can change its background color depending on the rest of the program. So all of this stuff here is just you know, basically, by default, when we start up the application, this text box will have these particular properties. Um, you have enabled here, if you uncheck that, the text box becomes you know, disabled, which means it still shows on the screen, but you cannot interact with it. Okay, it's just kind of grayed out. If you don't want it to be visible at all, there's a different one to uh, change that. It's under visible. You can change it from showing to hidden. Okay, so this is also you know, programmable. Okay, it doesn't make any sense if visible can only be set with properties, right? Because otherwise, if you if you t turn it to hidden, why even bother to have the text <laughs> box, right? But it can be changed in your program itself. Okay, so when it is not appropriate to have this text box, you can hide it so it doesn't you know interfere. Yep. Go ahead. Easter egg. Yeah. You can also do a lot of fun things because you can also put a text box inside a layout and then you can hide the entire layout. That's one way you can kind of emulate having multiple screens is to have multiple layouts and you only have one visible at a time. So all of these things, you know, most if not all of these things can be changed later on. But the focus now is what kind of events is coming from a text box. So we switch to the blocks view here. And you can see that in addition to screen one, we have text box one. And you can also see that it's using a you know, kind of like a hierarchical view. In other words, it's showing you that screen one contains text box one. So this really shows you what element is containing which other element. When you get to layout uh, design, you know, it is really helpful to, to be able to visually see what contains what else. When you click on text box one, it shows you all of these things. So it, can, it shows you that text box one has two particular events. One is got focus. In other words, you know, somebody click in it so you can see the blinky cursor. And the other one is lost focus when the blinky cursor is no longer in the text box because somebody you know, pressed you know, another button somewhere else on the screen. So th those are the only two triggers related to a text box that allows you to do something. Okay? When you first get focus into the text box, you can initialize it. You can put some default value into it. Um, you can pop up a little help box, you know, somewhere else, and say, "Okay, you know, this text box is for this purpose." You can do whatever you want when you have the got focus. Lost focus is a good opportunity to do to do some processing. Okay, somebody has just entered something, and now it's moving on to another field. Let me just double check and see what is being entered there, and see if it makes sense. Okay, so we speak. Okay. This is the, the other cool part, is as you write your program, the emulator is reflecting the changes. It's interactive. So, well, as quickly as it can, okay? <laughs> so it's not instantaneous as instantaneous, but the uh, programming environment does try to update the app that is being run in the emulator as quickly as possible. If you make this connection you know, using the Wi-Fi option on your actual device, like on your phone and whatnot, it will do the same thing. As you make changes to the application, it is being uploaded and update the actual app running on your phone. Nexus 5. Sorry? That's a Nexus 5. That's a Nexus 5. I think it's the, the best bang for the buck. Uh, I mean, Samsung devices you know, can be better in terms of camera and some of the other devices, but they are quite a bit more expensive for the same you know, type of uh, performance. I have a 4. You have a 4? It's also easy to root. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. So, are there any questions about this particular application? Well, let's go to the uh, screen one here and see. And you can see that I can just you know type here. The text box is active. 
and we can type something and press the enter key and nothing happens because I have not really programmed the app to do anything about te the text inside a text box. Are there any questions I can answer at this point about you know, event handling? What an event is, how do we specify the code to handle it inside App Inventor 2? Okay, well, let me ask you another question then. What if I have two handlers for back pressed? Okay. So if I drag this block again, oh, we have had something on the screen now, right? You can see that there's a little triangle, you know, a little hazard, you know, sign. And when you see something like that, you know, don't ignore it because it's trying to tell you something. If you hover over that, it shows a little text box or bubble here. And it says, you know, this is a duplicate event handler for this component. And the app is not going to work. Okay? So you can only have one... Compiler error. Sorry? Compiler error. It is kind of like an error. It's a compiler error, but it is kind of interactive. So as soon as you pop this block in, it gives you an error. And if you delete one of them, then it will go away. Now remember, this is really interactive. You can just click on the hazard sign and see you know, what the problem is and click on it again to make the, uh, the message go away. If you remove the duplicate block, then the error goes away. Okay. Are there any questions about um, the programming interface here or the concept that you can only have one handler per event? Well, I should say up to one because you can specify nothing and say, okay, you can do whatever you want. I'm not, not going to handle that particular event. No questions? Right. So if there are no questions, I'm going to go back to my slide here. Uh, I have just briefly explained what an event is. And here is all the you know, kind of event handler things. And some are complicated, like a canvas has you know, like an event handler that has all of these what we call parameters. In other words, when you drag something in a canvas, we'll talk about the canvas you know, later on in the semester, the code inside in the do block, has, they, it has access to all of these parameters, like start x, start y, previous x, previous y, current x, current y, and drag sprite. Okay? So all those things are supplied to the code inside the do block because you will need that in order to do you know, in order to process what we call a drag event inside the canvas. Okay. Sorry? A canvas is it allows certain types of uh, user interaction that is not um, that can that you cannot do elsewhere. Um, it also has a concept of a sprite, so you can quote unquote automate you know a particular thing that moves by itself, and then you can you can also detect the, the, uh, de you can also detect collision and stuff like that. We can write you know, very simple games using it. Um, it's not particularly efficient, uh, but it's doable. Yep. <clears throat> so that brings up the next question: What if I want to do something quote unquote in the background? Uh, in other words, I want something to be done, but without being triggered by a, the end user actually clicking something, or dragging something, or doing something at all. Okay? It is possible, but it's not easy. Okay? And you can only do certain things like, um, you can only do things that would take a short amount of time. Okay? So you cannot have a lot of background processing that is continuous, like, oh, I want to crack this encryption key in the background. Nah. It will be kind of hard to do with App Inventor too. Okay. So one thing you can do is what we call a clock device. When you use a clock, you can trigger what we call timer events. Okay, things that are just going like click, 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 and then for each click, you can specify a event handler and say, oh, okay, it's time for me to do a little bit of processing. Okay, something that I have to do, let's say every 500 milliseconds or half a second or something like that. You can set the timer. Uh, itself to you know, basically time out every so often, and I can you know, show you right away you know how what that means. So let me switch back to uh, the designer view, and we'll take away this text box here. And once again, if you want to remove something, you go to the components window and not in the viewer window here. So you go to co the components window, 
make sure text box one which is the one that you want to remove is selected and then you click delete to get rid of it sorry have to block the entire file on the app instead for the text before it locks out. Say again? Have to block the entire for how long they can have to enter text into the text box. Then we need a... Uh, yeah, I guess that will work. But you can only do it, you know, like at the beginning. I can, uh, I can specify a clock here just so that you can see what it looks like. A clock is now under sensors. You know, they, can, they keep moving things around in between the categories a little bit. So if you cannot find it initially, you can just you know kind of search through it. Uh, you can click the little question mark in you know, a bubble here, and it will show you basic help of what a clock is. But if you want to see more about what a clock is, you can click on more information. Then it will tell you everything that you need to know about the clock. So it's really kind of nice. You know everything is self-contained. You don't have to use you know Google to search for something. Okay, when you use uh, when you use Eclipse with Java. To write your know, applications, then you are on your own. You have to use a search engine, you know, to look up the documentation. Use open up a new tab in the browser, you know, to keep yourself, you know, at a certain place and so on and so forth. This is really a whole lot easier. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll drag a clock into the application, but because a clock is what we call a hidden type of interface, um, it does not show. It's a component that is non-visible. So it's not inside the main screen here, but you can see it is still a component in your application. Now, if you look at the properties of a clock, it looks really, really simple. Okay, um, the first one is timer always uh, always fires. So that means you know it is enabled, and you know when it is every in this case the timer interval, the last item, specifies the number of milliseconds um, of you know, the timer you know timing out. So in this case, it times out approximately every second, okay? And because I'm enabling the timer, and I also enable always fires, that means every one second, you will get a quote-unquote tick, okay? You get a timer, time out event. If I disable this, but keep the timer enabled, enabled, what that means is it will uh, turn on, it will time out, and then it will turn itself off, and not to be turned on again. Okay. Yep, go ahead. I have a question about the ticks. It uh, is 1,000 one second. It's 1,000 milliseconds. Oh. So one millisecond is 1,000th of a second. So 1,000 millisecond is one second. Right. Um, it's only approximate. You know, if you try to keep track of time, that would not be a good way to do it. <laughs> okay, there are much better ways to keep track of the current time. Okay, so I'll just keep it the way it is, you know, keeping all the defaults. Let's switch back to the blocks view and see what type of event a timer can generate. So once we get back into the blocks view, we go to clock here, and you can see that a timer or clock only has one particular event, which is when clock one dot timer. Okay. So we'll go ahead and drag it out here. And by the way, the program is being constantly being recompiled and re-uploaded onto the emulator. But since we didn't specify anything, that's nothing to do, right? All right, so let's go ahead and figure out what we can do here. We haven't really talked about variables. We haven't talked about conditional statements or loops or, any, or anything like that. So what possibly can we do when a timer times out uh, for every second, okay? If I, uh, if I change the background color to a fixed color, um, it's not exactly visible because you know, the first time is visible, but the second time when I change it from a mango color to a mango color, um, visually you cannot see any difference. Uh, we are not displaying anything, there's no text to display. So what else can we do? Well, let's take a look. We go back to screen one and we say, well, let's see what else we can do with the screen. Yeah, let's see. We can change the background, color, you know, animation, and stuff like that. But you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the background color. Okay, but tech, you know, we are running into the same problem here. We cannot see that the background color has actually changed. And I'm not using a variable to keep track of the current color and roll to the next one. But I can do something even better. I can go to the colors block and use make color. 
okay? Well, that's not very exciting because when I have, you know, this is RGB, so this is basically turning the background color to red after you know, one second. And for every second, it will turn it into red, okay? Let's see if the app is actually doing that, okay? Because right now, I have two event handlers. One is when, back is when the back button is pressed, and the other one is when the timer times out, and that's on an every second basis. So that means you know the screen should be in what color at this point? The app is running already. It should be red. Because every, for every second, it's turning it into red, okay? Well, let's see. It is red. What if I click the back button? <laughs> it turns it into mango, and then within a second, it will turn it back into red because the timer is still going, right? So let's double check. It's quite annoying, isn't it? <laughs> okay, but we can make this even more exciting because what we can do is to throw away all of these items. When there's a block you don't need anymore, you can just kind of throw it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Complain. Keep complaining. All right. So when there's an error or when there's a warning here, it's not the program stops working, okay? It's not running anymore. So what we'll do is we'll go to math and then we'll pick random numbers. <laughs> so we'll pick random numbers here. And if I just slide it over a little bit. So now the RGB values are basically just a random number from one to 100. And we can change it to 0 to 200. Yeah, it keeps complaining. The time to get number, item number 3 of list length 2. You will not see another error reported for 5 seconds. Okay. So we'll change these to 255. And by the way, this is the first time I touched the keyboard as far as this program is concerned. Okay. Everything else that I did was basically just drag and drop and click. This is the first time I actually had to use the keyboard for something. Right. Well, the program is updated right away, so we can just switch back to the emulator and see what happens. So every, you know, so every second, it changes the color to something else. Now, don't do this to an actual app, okay? Because it's very, very annoying to the end user, okay? But for the demonstration of an event handling you know, type of program without using a text box or anything else, I don't think this is a bad program to illustrate the concept of using a timer and also to use the concept of you know, event handling. The only thing that you can trigger as an end user is the back button. So if I click this fast enough, you know, it will be mostly mango. <laughs> Are there any questions about this application? How do we make this even more annoying? Speed it up. Speed it up, exactly. Speed it up. So you can go to the designer view and change the time interval to, let's say, 250 milliseconds, which is a fourth of a second. And the app should change like right away. So now it's updating the color every, you know, four times per second, approximately so. Okay, that's really annoying. So let's go ahead and you know, change it to maybe 2,000. Okay. <laughs> But it really kind of shows you what you can do with App Inventor 2. You know, the programming interface is very, very interactive. Okay, you know, it doesn't have another button to say, oh, build a project, now upload it to the device, now run it from the device. Nope, you make changes and it's instantaneous. It is updated right away. Yep. So do we have a button that when pressed changes the interval of the clock to a different time? You can't change the interval within the program itself because when you switch to blocks view and you look under clock one, uh, and you have to kind of scroll down here a little bit, you can go to set clock one timer interval and you can set it to whatever number you want to specify. In other words, with this program, we can change it to a random number. <laughs> Not only is the color random, yeah, but the time that it takes for the next update is also random. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm having too much fun here. Um, any questions? No questions? Yep, go so ahead. For the random number generator? Yeah. Uh, is being used on a browser and then uh, uh, used on the emulator? Does that take up any more uh, like cycles as far as uh, using the random number generator? 
Well, it's not a true random generator. So once the seed is determined, it is what we call a pseudo random number generator. Um, so what it what involved what is involved is a multiplication and a mod operation, and both are considered relatively efficient for modern processors. So I don't think it's going to be too time consuming you know, using the random number generator. Okay, that's a good question. All right, any other questions about event handling? No questions about event handling. Let's move on. Now, I just want to do a quick poll here, you know, because you know, depending on the answer as a whole from the class, that would kind of change the way I teach this class and also the pace of this class. How many people have some programming background, kind of already? Okay, so we have a few. Okay, and and f when I said your programming, you know, experience, you know, it doesn't have to be like actual. C, C++, you know, programming can be some kind of scripting, like you know, PHP scripting, JavaScript, you know, scripting, um, can be bash scripting, okay, if you have taken CIS C323 and 324, you would have done some, you know, Unix uh, type of bash scripting, that counts as programming as well. Okay. Right. So, but getting back to this point here, this is how you can do something quote unquote in the background. Okay, in other words, use the timer to, to basically trigger some operation in the background. The only thing is whatever you're doing quote unquote in the background as a part of the handler of timer cannot be time consuming. Because if it is time consuming, then the program cannot react to actual user interaction. Okay, so it can only take a very short amount of time. Every time it clicks, Give it a little bit of processing to do, and then it has to stop. Right. So if there are no questions about that part, um, we can also talk about a notifier. Okay. So we're just kind of moving through the uh, the notes you know, one by one here. I'm gonna close this one because it's already done. I'm closing all of the other ones. And You can read about this part here, but I'll just show you interactively what it is and what you can do with a notifier. So inside the application, <coughs> let me switch back to design view. And by the way, if you remove a component that already has code associated with it, it will warn you ahead of time. So let me, if I, if I delete the clock one, it says here, deleting this component will delete all blocks associated with it in the blocks editor. Are you sure you want to delete? Okay, so if I do this, then everything in the blocks editor is gone. Everything that's related with a, a clock, with clock one, is now gone. So I'm get, get, getting back to the designer, and this time I want to go to user interface and specify a notifier. A notifier is also classified as a non-visible component. In other words, it's there, but it's not visible normally. Okay, you have to say, oh, notifier, I want you to do something now. Then it can pop up a dialog box on the screen and do something, and let you see a message, read a message, confirm something, or otherwise, do something about it. So let's go back to the blocks editor here and click notifier one and see what we can do with it. There are quite a few things we can do with it. Um, the event handlers do not make any sense because unless you are displaying a message box, you cannot choose anything. So after choosing or after text input, does not make any sense unless we can make the notifier pop up something first so that you can interact with the notifier. And with this program, the, the only place it, that makes sense so far is to deal with um, you know, when screen one dot back pressed. But let's not do that. Let's go, go ahead and use an actual button. So I'll just kind of drag the button over here, and when you create a button, it has a default text of text for button one. You can change that. You can change both the name of the button itself as well as the default message of the button. Let's go ahead and do both, and let's change the name of the button here first. Okay. So I'm going to rename the button, so you have to make sure that your component is selected first, and then you click rename, and then you can change the name to um, something else. 
Um, I just you know changed the button to BTN you know as a as an abbreviation because otherwise you end up with pretty long names and it's not particularly useful. So I use BTN to represent the button, and we'll just call this you know activate activate um, notifier notifier. There we go. And then we'll go back. We'll go to properties here and change the default text for this particular button to notify. Oops, I was typing in the wrong window. Notify. There we go. Okay. So I've now changed the the, the name of the component and also the what the text or the caption on the button itself. Now we can go back to um, the blocks editor. Click on button activate notifier and you can see it has quite a few you know uh, events that we can handle here um, click makes sense long click is even better okay so now you know with a single button you can actually select okay if it's clicked we'll do this but if it is long clicked we'll do something else okay gives you the option of choosing of dealing with it touchdown option. is not particularly useful for a button so I'm not gonna use that is that like so, a gesture? Sorry? Is that a gesture? Um, the text, it actually should show you how, okay, in the case when the button was pressed down, and this is when you let, let it go, oh. okay? So they are basically sub-events of a click or a long click. Because with a click, it starts with a down and then an up. So this gives you the option to do something when the button is not registered as quote-unquote clicked, it's just that you have kind of press it. And it gives you another chance to do something else when you release it. So if you want to get uh, special you know, sound effects, for instance, uh, this is a good place to attach you know, the sound effect. Because when you press it, you know, then you can play, you know, play a particular click sound. When it's released, you, release, you can you know, play another click sound. But for this program, I just want to deal with click. So I select this event here. And what I want to do is to just to pop up the notifier, show a dialog box, and say, hey, you know, this dialog box or this notifier is now active. Okay? So I go to notifier 1 and find out what it can do. I don't want to deal with the event handler for the notifier, but I want to, uh, <coughs> I want to make the notifier to do something. And those are those are, those are the call blocks. Okay? So we can have the notifier to do a log error, log info, log warning. No, nope, those are not what we want to do. Um, show alert is the easiest one, so we'll go ahead and pick this one. Call notifier one dot show alert. And if you hover the pointer over here, it shows you display a temporary notification. Okay. So we'll go ahead and drag it put it here and the notice has to be some kind of text so what we do is we go to the text block here under built-in and we go for the simple one. the simple one is really just you know in double quotes and you can specify whatever you want to say here so you can say notifier one is activated Right, so that's my entire program. Switch to the emulator, and you can see that it's updated already. Okay, this app is already updated, and I click notifier notify, and it shows you know notifier one is activated, and then it fades away. Okay, this is a really kind of interesting way to show a message, but you only want it to show messages that are kind of not so important. You know, kind of just saying, okay, I got this done, I got this done, I got this done. You don't want it to be very important because what if someone cannot read that message before it fades out? So for, so for anything that is important, you want to use the notify in a different way to show a dialog box that requires the end user to click a button in order for the message to go away. This is good, you know, if you're just saying, okay, I'm making a the game is being loaded, okay, and there's no problem. I just want to let you know that I am doing something, okay? There is progress. That's okay. But if you have an actual error message, I wouldn't use you know, this particular method. All right, so let's go back to this window here. If you want to save a block and say, I want to reuse it later, but I want to delete the other block that it's attached to, you can do that. You can have basically quote unquote blocks that are dangling 
and it's not attached to anything. Now obviously at this point, notifier when it's activated as a string or as text is not used anywhere in the program. It's just sitting there doing nothing. But that's perfectly okay. Okay, if you want to reattach it later, that's okay. So what we'll do is to get rid of this block here, go back to the notifier one and see what else we can do with it. Okay, if you want to show a dialog box that requires the end user to click something, this is the way to do it. You can either use show message dialog, and let me display the background text here. Display an alert dialog with a single button that dismisses the alert. Okay, so this is one way to make sure that the end user has a chance to read the message and take as long as he or she wants. So I, I want the message to be notify one is activated. The title applies to the dialog box itself. It's at the top of the dialog box. So it usually would be something that's simple. So I, will, I can go to text here. And by the way, there's another way to do this. If you click this block here and you start typing, it will automatically go to the next available text block, if I remember correctly. So we'll, we'll see. And if you say alert, nope. Okay, I can type text, and it will it will basically give me um, a selection of what boxes is a, or what components, what blocks are available, and the text box is available here. And then if I type here, I think it goes into here. Um, nope, it does not. I have to actually click it. And the button text will just uh, use another text here. So we say text, gives me a text block, and then click in here. And I'll just get, click say this means. All right. So now this time it will give me a dialog box, and it will show the message, and it will require the end user to click the button labeled dismiss in order to get rid of the message. Switching back to the emulator, click notify, and you can see that's exactly what it's going to do. So are there any questions at this point? Questions? Okay. <clears throat> so if I click dismiss, you know the message box, you know, just kind of goes away. And that's basically what the, this block is. And a screenshot of you know the effect of the notifier. We are done with. Um, a notifier. We kind of briefly talked about properties of the screen already. Uh, this one is kind of interesting <clears throat> because it has to do with App Inventor 2. It's kind of built to run on a smaller device. If you have a, um, a large tablet that has a high resolution screen, things will look really awful on it, okay? Because it just scales everything up so that it looks like a small device. Okay, so there are ways to get around it, you know, but I, I'm not going to talk about this, you know, at least for the time being, because it does have a lot of kind of funky stuff that you have to do, like many, many steps that you have to do in order to, to get this to work, and you have to install some additional tools like APK tool, um, so I'm, not, I'm just going to skip this one for now. But for those of you who are kind of experienced with hacking stuff, you know, I, oh, I, can, I can deal with tools like that. In, you know, to get my application to look right on a high resolution device, you can go ahead and read this part and just say, oh, okay, I want, to, I want a challenge, I want to know how to do this. Uh, but the rest of the class, you can just kind of safely ignore that for the time being. So are there any questions about writing applications with App Inventor 2 up to this point? Questions? Go back to this part here. Okay, this is you know, getting back a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about what a sequence diagram is. I'm not going to read my own notes, you know, because it's a, there's a lot of text here. You know, you can read it on your own after the class or before the class. But instead, we'll go to the Wikipedia entry of a sequence diagram. And zoom is way too out. This is better. 
This is what we call a sequence diagram. I just want to shrink it enough that we can see the entire diagram. Um, a sequence diagram is kind of like a special videotape. It records how um, a particular actor may interact with a system. So in this case, it's a snapshot. This is a particular scenario of using your application. Okay, so it shows the interaction. Um, the way we call these things is, you know, each one, each vertical column is called a lane, and then you can have messages, you know, going back and forth between the two lanes to represent, you know, okay, the computer will send um, unsent email as a message to the server, and then it will send a new email to the server, the server will respond to it, and so on. So this is a way for you to document um, possible scenarios of how an end user or something else may interact with your app. Okay. So this is useful you know, to document something that can potentially be a little bit more complicated. Like you know, failing to log in three times, you know, how do we lock it out, you know, what kind of message do I want to display, and stuff like that. It does not actually show the logic behind the application. In other words, it is really just showing you a particular instance <coughs> of how you may expect an end user to interact with your application. It does not actually show you the code of how to make it happen. It's like a storyboard for a movie. Exactly. Exactly like a storyboard. You know, it's kind of like a way for you to document, okay, you know, in case of, you know, uh, failed authentication, this is how I want my application to work, you know, to react to a user. But it doesn't really show you the code or the logic behind it. Are there any questions about the general idea behind a sequence diagram? So if there are no questions, um, we are fairly, you know, we're, we're kind of, according to the, the thumbnail here, we are about one half through the, all the notes already. Um, but that's because we haven't really talked about, you know, the logic of programming, okay? And how to make use of variables, subroutines, and all the more advanced feature. And that's why I asked the question a little bit earlier to basically see, you know, where you guys are at in terms of writing programs and dealing with the logic of a program. Okay. So with all of these things, you know, kind of out of the way, you guys know how to navigate in App Inventor 2, you know, the tool itself. Um, I am kind of inclined to actually get into programming a little bit, talk about variables and control structures and stuff like that. So are there any objections to kind of, kind of branching out, you know, in that direction? Nope. Okay. Very good. So the first thing I want to introduce is the concept of a variable, okay? The concept of a variable is, well, you know, it's basically a, um, an item in your application that can store a value. And you can store a value, you can change the value, and you can also retrieve the value basically throughout the entire program, okay? So the purpose of a variable is you know, to store information so that your application can make use of that information later. You can also make changes to it. And to make a variable, you go to the variables um, tab here, and it shows you, you know, several things that you can do with a variable. Um, the first thing you want to do is to declare a variable. In C++ in Java, you have to do some explicit declaration and say, oh, I want to make use of this variable. Um, in App Inventor 2, it's kind of like that too. If you look at all of these blocks here, do you see one that does not, uh, that is standalone, it does not need to be inside something else or has to be connected to something and closing it? The first, the first one, right? Very good. The first one does not have a notch to fit anywhere else. It has a notch here, which means you know, it needs information to initialize the variable, but it does not need to be inside a block of anywhere else. So this is how you can create a global variable. Okay, and you can even see the name of the block itself is very explicit. Initialize global, and then whatever name you want to name your variable to the following, okay? Um, obviously, the first thing you want to do is to change the name. Okay, so we'll go ahead and change the name here. Um, and for this example, I'm just going to use a counter as an example. Okay, we'll just make use of a counter to count one, two, three, four, and so on. 
So the name of the variable is going to reflect what we are planning to do with it. You know, it is a counter. And as a counter, I probably wanted to initialize to zero first. So zero is a value, is a number, and we go to math here, and then we select this block here, and just say, okay, global variable counter is automatically initialized to zero. Are there any questions about declaring a variable and initializing to zero? So initially it has a value of zero, but as the name implies, a variable means that it can change. So the program code can make changes to it. So the next thing we want to do is to say, well, let's pick out a place to make changes to this particular variable. Ah, we had a timer before. We can still kind of use that timer, or we can attach that code to click. In other words, every time we perform a click, we want to increment the counter by one. We want to add one to the counter. Okay. So let's find out what we can do with a variable. But where, where do we find a variable now? I mean, how do we find out what we can do with counter? Well, since it's a variable, we get here. And then you can see there are only several things you can do with a variable. You can get the value of a variable. You can also change the value of a variable. If I want to increase a variable by one, which one should I use, get or set? set. To set, right? We are changing the variable, changing the value of the variable to something else. So we'll go ahead and drag this block here and put it inside the um, <coughs> button click event handler, and if you use the drop-down box, it automatically gives you a selection of variables that are visible in this context. Now, since we only have one single global variable of the entire program, that becomes the only choice. But if you have multiple variables already de defined, this will give you, you know, a list of variables that are accessible at this point. Okay, so we now say set global, set global counter to what do, you, what do we want to set it to? Remember, our objective is to increase it by one, okay? So what do we do to increase it by one? Counter plus one. Counter plus one. This is the part where, you know, you wish you can type it. <laughs> <laughs> but you cannot, okay? The, the drag and drop is nice when you're just starting out your programming, but once you're already kind of seasoned and you kind of know your way around programming, it can be tedious, okay, to have to drag and drop everything. Because in order to say, you know, counter plus one, I now have to go to math here, drag and drop the plus operator, the addition operator here, and now we have to go back to variables and click, you know, get global counter here, go to math and drag and drop one, okay, but well zero, but you can change it to one. This is how you specify, I want to increase counter by one. <laughs> so the very same thing that made App Inventor 2 very user-friendly, easy to work with, also makes it very tedious to do things that you normally would say, oh, I can just type it, right? Counter gets counter plus one. Or in most, plus one. Or counter plus plus, even better. Or plus plus counter in C++ in Java. Okay. All right, that's good. So now I have a definition of a variable up here. I have a place to change the value of the variable by one. But I don't have a place to actually make use of the variable, okay? So one place I can use it is to use it in the message itself, okay? So instead of just saying the notifier one is activated, let's see if we can make it say, uh, say active, notifier one is activated so many times. Okay, once, one times, two times, three times, and so on. Is that okay so far? Okay. So the first thing we want to do is to make sure that our counter is in fact you know, incrementing or decrementing. So we'll just change the message to the number itself, to counter itself. So it's not gonna actually say anything except we'll just display a number. So to do that, we go to variables, and then we say get global counter, We'll just stash it there. We have one warning. Let's double check and see where's my warning. My warning is here, which means you know, this block is not connected to anything. 
which is okay, it's just a warning. In this case, you know, you can see the, uh, the hazard symbol here is in yellow color, which means the program will still run, it's just that you might want to take a look at this. This may be a problem. Okay, so let's switch back to the application. Like it, okay, the first time it shows one, which is correct. And then it shows two, three. Okay, well, the app is running, you know, okay so far. But we don't want to just show the number. We want to say notify one is activated, the number, and then times, right? And I don't want to make it so you know complicated. Like you know, the first time it's just you know once instead of saying one time, you know, it is once. I just want to make it very generic. Okay, we have text and text and then the number in the middle. The way you do that. <coughs> So I'm going to drag it over here because I'm going to reuse this component. When you go to text, it has um, a particular block that is really useful for something like this. Let me see where it is located. Okay. Join, that's it. Okay, so join is really useful because it allows you to specify different segments that will merge together into one single text. Okay. So now you can specify this component is static. This is exactly verbatim what I want to do. This component relies on a variable. And then this component is static text again. Okay, just predetermined text. So we'll go ahead and say, oh, but we need three things, not two. Because we want to say, you know, notify one is activated as one piece, and then the number from the variable as another piece. But we want one last piece of times and an exclamation point. Well, that's easy to fix. See this little icon here? Click it, and you can say, oh, okay, I can see that join now is only expecting two strings. If you want to get a new string or have three components in a join, just drag this one over here into the block here. Now it has three notches. Hmm? Or you can have a join inside the join, that works too. <laughs> All right, so now we have three notches, which is exactly what we want. The first one goes here, the second one is here, and then the third one is, you know, kind of like a part of the first one. So we'll go ahead and go to text. Oh, by the way, you can also uh, duplicate. So you can just right click here and say, you know, duplicate. And now we have another block. So now we can, we can change the first one to notify is activated, but get rid of the exclamation point number and then on the third one we'll say space times and an exclamation point all right well we'll double check and see if the program works switch back to the emulator notify one is activated four times four times why we haven't reset the counter because the program is still running. Okay, while you make updates to the program, it does not reinitialize the whole program. It is it doesn't reload the entire program. Okay, so that means you might want a different mechanism of you know initializing the counter. Okay, or at least have a button to say initialize. Okay, I want to reset everything to the default value and start from here. Okay, but this is something that you want to keep in mind is when your screen is up and running, it doesn't, the, the, the global variables do not get reinitialized. Okay, any questions about this part? Okay, there are no questions. We are running out of time today, um, so if you come in late and you have not signed the row sheet, you know, please go ahead and do it. Um, we only have one homework assignment at this point, which is the Hello Pro program. Um, I think most of you are done already with that program. If not, you know, it won't take you too long to get it done. But what you really want to do is to kind of think about what type of application you want to write you know, for this class as a project. Okay? Um, I'm going to have you guys to turn in a project proposal. I'll go over that each, you know, for each person and kind of give you some feedback like, oh, this is a great idea, uh, but you might want to kind of limit the scope a little bit because it looks a little bit ambitious to me or it can expand a little bit, you know, this looks, may, maybe you need something, something in addition to what you're proposing. So think about it. There's nothing to turn in for your homework, uh, for your project proposal for the time being. But think about it because, you know, you kind of need time to really think about what you want to do, you know, how far you can go with this, you know, 
type of programming environment and stuff like that. All right? So I'll see you guys on uh, Wednesday. And if you come in late, you know, make sure that you uh, put your name or initial next to your name for today's call. All right, I'm gonna start, stop the recorder and have it upload.